Good afternoon. Welcome to what I think should be a really extraordinary event and a very timely one. It's something that we did not exactly plan, uh, and yet sometimes I think things work out best when you don't overwork them, when they fall together in sort of a following the zeitgeist, perhaps. Uh, things do come in patterns and for reasons. And I think, especially with a lot of the issues, uh, on especially reproductive rights right now, a lot of concerns about resources. Uh, I think that this is a very timely uh, event, uh, this presentation today. I'd like to welcome, uh, first of all, you all for coming out today. It's kind of a blustery day, and better that you be here, right, rather than out fighting the wind and the cold. It's a good time this semester to take stock and to breathe a little bit and to think things that aren't on your usual agenda. And this is something that I think is really quite remarkable for us to have a speaker such as Dr. Rudy Solinger come to ASU campus. So if you all would please give Dr. Solinger a hand, please. You don't she know me yet. Is, um, I'm just going to be honest, she's very much a role model. Uh, for those of us who have labored in the field of women's history for a very long time, it was Dr. Solinger's work uh, that first came out as her dissertation, which would have been probably in the 80s when it came out as a dissertation. I am old, but it came out in the 90s. It came out in the 90s. <laughs> wow, you got it in a print quickly. Mm. Well, in any case, uh, Wake Up Little Susie uh, was the book that came out of the dissertation. The dissertation won uh, the Lerner Scott Prize from the Organization of American Historians, which is the premier uh, prize that a dissertation in women's history can win. And I believe she won the first one. And that really gave a lot of us in women's history a, a tremendous, uh, well, not just an inspiration, but a validation. Because it's important to really understand that what you do is not just worth doing for, for your own self, but certainly that it has uh, something, a, a life larger than, than yourself. And there's no question that what Dr. Solinger does by looking at, in this case with Wake Up Little Susie, the life, the options, the treatment of young single women, black and white, as they would discover that they were unwed and pregnant, and what that was like, especially prior to Roe v. Wade. She has spent uh, pretty much all of her life since the 90s continuing to look at issues of not just reproductive rights, but most especially for us today, reproductive justice. So she really challenges us to rethink our binaries that have done so much damage in terms of dividing our population, pro-choice, pro-life, et cetera, et cetera, that in many ways perhaps uh, there are avenues that we can take that move us beyond points that aren't so helpful. And to get us to really think what is needed in our society to be an effective society as mothers, as parents, and as communities. And so I would like to then, without further ado, to introduce you to Dr. Ricky Solinger, our guest, our speaker, and then we will go on and have a discussion with some additional experts and then open the floor to you. So Dr. Ricky Solinger. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's very nice to be here. It's nice to have the lights on and to be able to see your faces. Um, let's see. Let me pull this down so I can see everybody's faces. Let's see. Can If I stand away from the microphone, can you still hear me all the way back? That's good. Um, so I am going to, for about the next 40 minutes, is that the right amount of time? Uh, for about the next 40 minutes, talk to you about why it seems so clear to me by now that the concept of choice, that term which was supposed to make women full citizens, 
to be able to be sexual persons, to be able to engage in reproduction or not with dignity and safety. That's what the legalization of contraception and the legalization of abortion were supposed to accomplish that women could be modern women, could make choices. Ultimately, it turned out for a number of reasons that I'm going to offer you that choice was not such a great term for guaranteeing women, modern womanhood, dignity and safety and I'm going to describe an emerging new idea and new language that people are using all over the country today to suggest another way of thinking about modern womanhood, dignity and safety, sexuality and reproduction. And that term is reproductive justice. And sometimes it pays is this better? Yes, it should be better. I, I do. Were you able to hear me without it? All right, I'll use it anyway, but I'm just, it's just a little ego check. Um, uh, sometimes it pays to stop and think about language. And one might think, well, choice, reproductive justice, what does it matter what we call it? We all know what we're talking about. Um, and I'd just like to um, sort of lay out a few other kinds of language that we've changed and that's been really consequential. I mean, you know, sort of the difference between calling a person in prison an inmate or calling that person an incarcerated woman. Big difference. One defines her totality as an incarcer as incarcerated. That's the only thing we need to know about her, or an inmate rather, an inmate. That's a, a very um, short and brutal way to describe somebody. Or if you call somebody who goes to a doctor a patient or a client. Um, it has consequences, implications for the agency, the power, the individuality of the person. Um, if you call, um, so there, there are many, many examples of this. If you, you know, a very common one that's I think often batted around, maybe particularly in the South, um, if you call a grown woman, a woman of 30 years old, if you call her a girl or a woman, um, does that, um, suggest things about that person's autonomy, dignity, grown-upness, maturity. So sometimes language isn't only language, it's not just a label, but it actually carries a really fundamentally changed meaning with it. And I'm going to make the case for you this afternoon that whether we call reproductive autonomy and dignity for women a matter of choice or a matter of justice really makes a difference. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do three things while I'm standing up here talking to you. And sometimes I'm going to be looking at my notes, but I, um, I hope that a lot of the time I'm going to be trying to look past these incredible lights um, into your faces. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is tell you the kinds of questions that are always in my mind when I'm writing books. And I write a lot of books. And I'm always sort of animated by a, the same old questions keep on um, nagging at me. And then after I do that, I'm going to tell you the three terrible things about choice and why they really, in fact, don't make women safe and dignified, but they have had the, the word choice has had the consequence politically of dividing women into good choice makers and bad choice makers and dividing women against each other. And then finally, after I do that, if there's still some time, I'm going to give you a few examples from American history that show how women have been divided into good choice makers, bad choice makers, and therefore into what I call legitimate mothers, women who have the right to be mothers, and women that politicians and policy makers say have no business being mothers. So to begin with, the kinds of questions 
that animate my work starts with that matter exactly. Who gets the right to be a mother in the United States? A legitimate mother, a mother whose motherhood is valued and supported and that policymakers and politicians approve of. And who doesn't get this right? Whose motherhood is devalued, degraded, talked about as if it shouldn't happen and her children are a nuisance to society? How do these matters get decided and enforced? Who has the power to do that? What does the government have to do with it? What does race and class have to do with who gets to be a legitimate mother in the United States and who does not? And this is a really big question that I'm going to come back to later. What does the individual behavior of any given woman have to do with her being defined as a legitimate or an illegitimate mother? How many children she has, how much money she has, how whether she gets to work on time. What are the consequences of being a legitimate mother in the United States or being an illegitimate mother? Big consequences. Those are my questions. Those are the questions I work in, um, work at over and over. And in fact, these categories, legitimate and illegitimate motherhood, have been working on the United States since even before this country became a country, even before the colonies became the United States, dividing women into these categories. Women who have the right to be mothers often because they reproduced what was considered by politicians, policymakers, and others to be valuable white citizens, and women who reproduced even though they didn't have any maternal rights and produced, for example, enslaved children who could be sold for money or made into no-wage workers and also other women who produced over time other kinds of socially degraded children. Especially after the 1970s, when contraception became legal, the pill was put on the market, the birth control pill was put on the market in 1960, and Roe v. Wade that legalized abortion in the United States occurred in 1973. So after abortion and contraception were both legal in the United States, the concept of choice became a very vibrant concept because women had all this medical equipment and opportunity to make a choice whether to get pregnant or not, whether to stay pregnant or not. So a woman who had too many children, more let's say than somebody thought she could afford, was considered a bad choice maker. She didn't make choices like a modern woman. When we think about reproductive rights today, we most often begin, especially at this moment, and it, especially in states like Arkansas and Tennessee and Mississippi and many, many other states, we think about state legislatures that are trying to pass laws that constrain women's ability to make choices. So in this state, they're trying to shorten the period for legal abortion. In um, the state of Virginia, they, the governor wanted to have a bill that mandated any woman who wanted to terminate her pregnancy had to have an ultrasound which would go into her body through her vagina. And uh, many, many other constraints being passed by legislatures um, to try to control to try to make, to limit access to contraception and to limit access or to, con or to curtail access to abortion. So that's where the conversation starts today. 
and it usually starts with these matters of we need to preserve. People like me talk about it with concern about preserving women's ability to control, to control their fertility, to not become pregnant when it's not a good time to become pregnant. That's a choice argument. It focuses very much on limiting fertility. But when we talk about reproductive justice, we need to pay a lot of attention to women's needs and, and this is key, this is totally key, their right to be mothers, not just their right to con control and constrain their fertility, but their actual right to have children with dignity, with safety, we need to talk, and when we talk about reproductive justice, about women having the right to be legitimate mothers, worthy of adequate, respectfully delivered medical care, and worthy of decent housing, for example, worthy of a safe environment, and the other basic human resources necessary to be a person in a civilized society and to be a mother, to be full and equal members of society. That's what reproductive justice says. You can't only talk about the importance of constraining fertility. You have to talk about women's right to have children born into safety and that children can only be safe if their mothers are safe. So we can't, I mean, that's, that's one of the great ironies is that sometimes public policy will fund programs for children, but they won't include the mothers. And yet, children whose mothers are safe are much likely to be safe themselves. Reproductive justice also wants to draw attention to the question of choice as the hallmark of modern womanhood. Can personal, individual, reproductive choice really guarantee every woman her dignity and her safety? Contemporary, the way that politicians talk about these matters and have talked, not so much right now, but have talked about it for the last generation, is that modern women are choice makers. Many of you sitting in this audience know this. You made the choice to come to college. You know, a generation and a half ago, there would have been few, or two generations ago, there would have been fewer women here. There would have been more women um, getting married very young. There would have been more women having, starting to have children very young. Many of you, the women students in this room know that you have, if you finish your four-year degree, you will have many choices to make. That is being a modern woman. So what's the problem with choice? I'm going to lay out the three terribles about choice now. First problem with choice as the defining mark of modern womanhood is that it pretends that all women are simply and similarly making free decisions and that society values the decisions and choices of all women the same. And yet, the woman who lives in the richest neighborhood in town knows that her pregnancy and her child allows her a different set of calculations than the po woman who lives in the poorest neighborhood in town, who knows that society might judge her and say, she doesn't have enough resources to have a baby. She has no business having a baby. What is she doing? So, while choice sounds like all women are freely and equally making decisions, the amount of resources you possess has a huge impact on how society judges your fertility, and you know it. 
choice ignore, uh, cho politicians and many ordinary Americans look at the rich woman and say, go at it, have a baby, sounds like a good idea, you deserve it, you can afford it. But they look at the poor woman and say, what are you thinking about? You bad choice maker, you have no business having a baby. Choice hides the fact that most powerful people in the United States and many others, unfortunately, really and truly define motherhood as an economic status. That is, do you have enough money in the bank to have a child? That's what politicians and policymakers generally think. If you don't have enough money, don't have a child. I'm always interested in how much is enough money to have a child and who's going to decide and how is that going to be enforced and how do you have to prove it? Um, you know, it used to be, it's possible, or we could, I don't want to say it used to be, but one can imagine that the, the status of being a mother could be what we call an affective status about emotions, about love. It could be a bi considered a biological status, that is the baby comes out of your body. But most Americans have come to talk about motherhood as an economic status. Um, that's a, a relatively new development. I mean, the fact is that most Americans historically have all have come from families that are not rich and yet in previous generations people didn't say if you don't have enough money you shouldn't have a baby and yet that's where we've come to today. That is a significant problem with choice. That is the choice to have a baby should only be exercised by women who have money. Second, um, the idea of personal choice pretends that good choice makers and bad choice makers are acting as free agents, as individuals, that their individual sexual activity and reproductive lives are what makes the United States a good country, either a good co a country, a nice country, or a country full of bad women, too many poor babies, and too many problems. Bad individual misbehaving women having too many babies become the culprit. They become the guilty ones, not the lack of living wages, the lack of adequate um, housing and medical care. What creates poverty in the United States? A woman who has one too many children for somebody's taste or the fact that women are paid still 77 cents on the dollar. And once you factor in race, the wage disparity is even greater. You know, 30 years ago, the largest employer in the United States was General Motors. It was a company that in which the workers, it still is a company, in which the workers were all unionized. What that meant was that those workers could get medical care, they earned a living wage, they had job security, they were not poor. They had a job and it paid them enough to buy a house, to send their children to college, to have a future, and to have security and safety. What's the largest employer today? It's everywhere. Walmart, yeah. Walmart, which is a famously anti-union company. It, you can bet that many women who work in Walmart, a woman who works in Walmart who has two children, and is not paid a living wage, has very poor medical benefits, um, may not have, um, if any, um, and may not have um, job security, and she's paid um, enough to keep her in poverty. What's more likely to be the cause of poverty in her life the fact that she has two children or the fact that she can't earn a living wage. 
So it always strikes me as so bizarre in the United States that politicians, policymakers, and so many ordinary Americans say the cause of poverty is poor women having too many children instead of saying how dare Walmart pay their workers wages that are too low to get them out of poverty. And because Walmart pays such low wages, we taxpayers have to subsidize Walmart because those workers require all kinds of federal support in the form of food stamps, in the form of Medicaid, in the form of all these taxpayer supported benefits. And yet, the same Americans who don't criticize Walmart and other organizations for not paying a living wage still get mad at women who have what somebody considers one child too many. And the concept of choice masks all that. They make it seem like individual women are making bad choices rather than looking at the large social structures that enforce races, that enforce poverty. For example, you know, when I talk about wages and I talk about how women are making around 77 cents on the dollar. And I said before that if you factor in race, it gets worse. So a Latina woman, for example, is going to be paid even less than 77 cents compared to a white man, let's say, maybe 63 cents. That's a function of racism. That's something that um, is supposed to be outlawed, and yet it isn't. It still continues to happen. And it's, it's, it causes poverty, it perpetuates poverty, and yet our public policies and our politicians continue to put the blame on the alleged misbehavior of individual women. Choice pretends that the most vulnerable people in the country, that is, poor women who are having children are the most powerful and dangerous because if these people make the wrong choices, if they have one too many children, especially if they reproduce themselves, the country will go to hell. Rather than being a pathway to individual dignity, choice becomes a pathway to smearing, staining, writing off many women in the United States and unwittingly promotes the degradation of poor women and women of color as not mothers. Third and finally, focusing on individual choice, and this is really important, masks the ways that laws and policies and other entities throughout American history defined and enforced the status of some women as good choice makers and legitimate reproducers while tarring and writing off and putting stigma on other women as illegitimate mothers and, um, uh, not, and poor choice makers. What I'm saying here is that we have actually passed laws in this country that have been devoted to trying to create and maintain the United States as a white country, to try to create and maintain a low wage or a no wage labor force, and to create and maintain laws that protect male supremacy, men's power over women. So there, there I want to give you, um, a couple of examples of how that has worked in American history. But before I do, I want to know exactly what time you want me to stop talking. I think in about 10 minutes, or maybe a little bit, 10 or 12 minutes, yep. Um, so the thing that's, that's really extraordinary is to think about how the United States, I mean, I, I feel like I'm saying um, a whole string, I'm, I'm such a, um, I look like such a proper middle class woman and I'm up here saying these very, very um, 
sort of radical things about how um, how the concept of choice has been so damaging. It's been okay. It's been, it's worked very well for women who look like me, women who have enough money to get contraception or to decide when to have children or decide not to have children or to protect myself if no one would ever say to me, um, why do you have two children instead of one? Or how can you possibly think about having a third child? But it has worked extremely poorly for um, for women who have fewer resources, for women who um, are vulnerable to um, the judgments of others. And I, as I've gone through my years of talking about these matters in various ways, I almost never um, speak in a, in a setting like this where people don't raise the question, um, do you think anybody, even if she has no money, should has the right to be a mother? And what does poverty? Why should a poor woman be allowed to have a child? And why should she? She shouldn't even make that choice. So it seems to me worth devoting myself to pointing out how what a really corrosive, ultimately, a really negative concept choice is because of the way it divides women into good choice makers and bad. And I want to end here by giving you some examples in American history of how the law, the actual law itself, has enforced this and made it absolutely central to who gets valued as a mother and therefore who gets valued as a child and who gets degraded as a mother and a child. And I want to start with something that happened in the United States that was enormous, happened on the North American continent before there was even a country. And it was so important to the first 300 years of history here, right here. And that was that when African people were first brought to North America as slaves. The white men who were in power at that time based all their laws that were governing the colonies, the North American colonies, on what was called English common law. And English common law said that when a baby is born, the status of that baby, slave or free, follows the status of the father. That's what the English common law said. But the white men who were governing the colonies here said, well, if we follow English common law, we're going to produce a population because we know that a lot of the children who were born under, that, under the slavery regime were born from coerced sex, sex between enslavers and enslaved women. It, we are going to produce a population of babies who are colored but free. That will harm our project here where we want to get have a very clear cut concept of race and freedom. There are white people and there are black people, there are free people and there are enslaved people. If we let the status of the father determine who is, what the status of the baby is, it won't work. And we won't have a ever growing population of enslaved laborers. We have a labor, labor problem here and we have a race problem here. We will solve it by saying that the status of the baby will follow the status of the mother. If the mother is enslaved, then the baby is enslaved. And with that one little change over the next several hundred years, there was a constantly growing population of enslaved laborers who made ever more bountiful 
the profits and the property of white enslaving, white slave owning, so-called slave owning people. So that is reproductive politics. That shows um, the vulnerability of um, the bodies of enslaved women. It shows how the reproductive capacity, the ability to have children on the part of slave women solved, was used to solve major problems in the colony. How do we solve the problem of race, of white supremacy? How do we solve the problem of labor? We do that by changing the law and therefore the meaning of children, of the children who were born to enslaved women is utterly altered. Another example of how this worked, and this is really important too, um, jumping forward quite a bit, in 1935, during the Great Depression, when poverty was just 75% of the people in Chicago were out of work, um, huge dislocation, people lost everything. The United States was one of the only countries by 19, only Western industrialized rich countries by 1935 that did not have any kind of social provision for poor people that came from the federal government. If you were, you could starve to death. You could lose your house. You could have to go wandering looking for a job with nothing. Franklin Roosevelt who was the president in 1935, finally convinced the Southern, Cong the Southern senators who controlled Congress at that time, we have to have protection for people who have nothing, who were losing everything during the Depression. The Southern Congress people said, okay, we will vote for it, but there's one catch. He said, we will only vote for it if you make social provision for mothers and of single mothers, not single mothers, but widowed, divorced, deserted mothers. They always had to have been previously married. And their children, we will only allow you to do that if you make it for white people only. And they said this, and it's in the congressional record, if you make it for everybody, who will iron our shirts and who will pick our cotton? So when social provision started in the United States, it was for white people only, and the way they did it was that they said, we have two excluded categories, agricultural workers or domestic workers and domestic workers. And in 1935, and in 1945, and to some degree even in 1955, the United States had an apartheid labor system, which means that certain jobs were for whites only, and certain jobs were for African Americans. And in most, many places, certainly in the South, if you were African American woman, chances were very good that the only jobs you could get were agricultural or domestic. What did that mean? Why was that reproductive politics? Because if you were a divorced, deserted, or widowed woman and you were African American and you, wanted, and you needed aid to dependent children, they would say, not for you, you're an agricultural worker, a domestic worker. We don't care about you, you go find somebody else to take care of your children. You've got to get back to the, um, the kitchen of some white woman. If you were a white woman and you went and asked for aid to dependent children, if you've been deserted, divorced, or widowed, the aid to dependent children office would say, oh, you need to be the mother of your children. You can't work. You have to go home and take care of your children. This is federal policy, I mean, state by state, but there was, each state made some of its own rules, but federal policy excluded these mothers of color. That is reproductive politics. That's saying whose children matter and whose children don't matter. Whose motherhood is legitimate and whose motherhood is only her own business and she just better stop having children if she doesn't want to have that problem. So, 
Um, I'm about to end, but I um, want to underscore this last point that the United States, I could go on and on giving you examples of laws in the United States that were set up to value and protect the motherhood and the reproductive capacity of some women but not others. And that's why choice doesn't work because choice makes it sound like it's an individual matter not about issues like pay and racism and unions and um, federal support and all these other big, big structural factors which determine and have determined across American history whose motherhood is legitimate and whose is not. It's not an individual matter, it's this big, big issue. And I would like to suggest that hearing about all this and hearing about all the injustice that still exists is sort of an invitation in many ways for thinking about, it could be an invitation for thinking about your future, for thinking about when one thinks about, oh, it, is race no longer an issue in the United States because we have a black president? Is um, sexism no longer an issue in the United States because I don't know why, maybe because Hillary Clinton's going to be our next president, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but actually, there's so many ways in which there's still really um, meaningful and engaging and important social justice work to do. And I offer you, um, I hope I've offered you a bit of a vision to think about that as a possibility um, as you think about what to do next. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think we've got a lot to think about there. Uh, because certainly the language of choice is something that is, it's uh, long overdue that we do rethink about at least how we have discussed these issues. Uh, I would like to, I'm going to introduce someone who will then introduce a bunch of people. But first of all, I want to thank uh, certainly Arkansas State University and this beautiful student union. Don't you love this facility? It's tremendous but also, most especially, uh, Dean Lori Mansky, uh, who is the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences uh, for making this possible, the Office of Diversity, and Lily Fears, most specifically, uh, those two for providing uh, the major funding uh, for this particular event, as well as the History Department, the Political Science Department, and the College of Nursing. So if we could give all of our funders a big round of applause. to introduce uh, one of my wonderful colleagues, and I have to say we have quite a number of wonderful colleagues at Arkansas State University. Uh, professor Sandra Holmes, uh, who is an assistant professor in journalism, and she is one of those people who doesn't just teach. In journalism, you actually work, and she was for 22 years a full-time journalist in Detroit for the Detroit News. And uh, I would just love to sit down and talk with her for days. I'm sure she's got all kinds of stories about that. Uh, but without further ado, I introduce Professor Holmes. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna ask our panelists to come up and then I'm gonna introduce them. You know who you are. <laughs> Executive Director of the Arkansas Minority Health Commission 
and she's held that position since 2009. Under her leadership, there's been an increased awareness of HIV and AIDS and sickle cell disease throughout Arkansas. She has put public policy toward equitable health care for all Arkansans at the forefront of her agenda. In keeping with this agenda, Dr. Trotter is also the facilitator of the Arkansas Minority Health Consortium. The consortium is a collaborative collaboration of about 30 entities united to increase awareness of minority health and community issues and the impact it has on minority health. Dr. Trotter was the first student to complete the concurrent master's degrees of public service and Juris Doctor degree program when graduated from both the Clinton School of Public Service and the Bowen School of Law at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. She is a true public servant. And in 2011, Arkansas legislative session, under Dr. Trotter's leadership, the commission and consortium play pivotal roles in ensuring the passage of several important pieces of legislation aimed at improving the health of minority, children, sickle cell victims, and HIV AIDS consumers, among others. The Commission and Consortium was also instrumental in broadening the passage of legislation that would have had a negative impact on minority health. Dr. Trotter currently sits on the Arkansas Minority HIV AIDS Task Force, the Arkansas Legislative Task Force on Sickle Cell Disease, and the Health Technology Consumer Advisory Committee. Sounds like she's really busy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kathy L. Young, next to her is coordinator of the Family Nurse Practitioner Track at Arkansas State University's College of Nursing and Health Professionals. She has earned a Doctor of Nursing Science Clinical from the University of Tennessee in Memphis. She has a post-master's from the University of Tennessee, MSN, University of Missouri, Kansas City, BSN, Webster University, St. Louis, Missouri, ABN from Mississippi, County Community College. Sounds like you can't keep her out of school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now working at ASU. Her research and teaching specialties include family and women's health, and she's an expert on domestic abuse and child abuse, and is often called upon by law enforcement agencies to assist with some cases locally and in the state. Next to her, um, last on our panel, but not certainly least, is Vicki Crego, Executive Director of the Women's Crisis Center of Northeast Arkansas. The center serves Craighead County, Green, Lawrence, Poinsett, Randolph, and Mississippi counties. Every month they receive an excess of 300 calls from women needing counseling, advice, and even shelter. Just let me give you a few statistics that propel Vicki into the job and work that she does. 28% of married couples experience one or more incidents of domestic violence. Three to four million women are severely assaulted by male partners each year. More than 50% of women murdered in the United States and killed by their partner or ex-partner. Battery is the single largest cause of injury to women, and 40% of all patients treated for serious injury in hospital emergency rooms are battered women. A woman is abused every nine seconds in the United States. In Arkansas, there are about 27 deaths each year attributed to domestic violence. About six of those occur in Northeast Arkansas. Ms. Kringo is, dedicated, is a dedicated advocate who works through a private 501c3 organization to provide shelter, safety, and essential support services for victims of sexual assault and domestic violence and support for their families. And then we have our, our moderator. Dr. Sarah Wilkerson Freeman. She's a professor of his history here at ASU. She's been here since 1976. 
Her specialty is women's history, public policy, and politics. Her published works include social work, social welfare, and women's rights activism. She has a bachelor's degree from the University of Iowa and a master's and PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. With that, I would like for you to welcome my panel and especially our keynote um, speaker today. And we will give each, at the start, 10 minutes to make an introductory remark, and then we'll go on from there. Thank you very much for coming. just say thank you for giving us an opportunity to uh, be here this evening and thank you to Dr. Sullinger. I really appreciate the, sometimes it's good to just talk straightforward. Being a New Yorker, you're used to that. Um, in Arkansas, we don't always do that. And so it's always refreshing to hear people that will just go straight to the issues and the points and uh, having the opportunity uh, being appointed uh, to this position as a state director to look at issues. Um, the Arkansas Minority Health Commission was established in 1991. Um, by then, uh, the work of Dr. Joycelyn Elders, and many of you may remember her, her as the Arkansas State Health Director at the time, who then went on to be our U.S. Surgeon General. Um, signed into law by then Governor Bill Clinton, and our organization was signed into law in order to look at those disparate issues that impact the health of minority citizens. When they did the research back then, they were able to determine and see that minorities were disproportionately impacted by just about every health issue that you can think of, whether it's diabetes or obesity or heart disease or what have you. And so our work really expanded to look at not only uh, those, to study those gaps and see what the reasons for those gaps were, but then to work into policy to see how we could do systematic changes to uh, eliminate those gaps. I can tell you that our work don't only focus on minorities, though. Uh, as long as I'm the leader, as long as I'm there, uh, this is bigger than minority uh, uh, citizens of Arkansas. This is about the overall health status of all of our citizens in Arkansas. And so I can tell you that as we go out in the state, and part of our charge is to go out in every four corners and in between of this state and do educational uh, awareness events, to do health fairs, to do public forums, and those individuals that come to our events from our surveys, about 40% of them are non-minorities. Because when, it, when you come to talk about issues, whether it's related to women or whether it's related to health, a lot of it relates to the underlying bottom denominator being poverty. And when you don't have money, how many of you in here, if you had money, and let's just say the women that's in here since we're focusing on women for a moment, but if you had as much money as you needed to to buy health insurance, how many of you would not purchase health insurance for your babies and yourself? Now let's just poll the whole audience for those guys who are in the room who have families. How many of you would, if you had the means to afford to purchase health insurance plus pay the light, gas, water, rent, how many of you would not purchase it for your family members and yourself? <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's an anomaly. So <laughs> there's one, there may be some who would choose that, but the great majority would choose to purchase insurance, would choose to take care of their children, would choose to take care of themselves as women. And that's what we face here in this state when we look at the issues of you know, why individuals, why health insurance is important, why health is important to women. I just want to refer to a 2012 study that was derived from a, a, an a, not an act, but a bill in 2011 when the legislative session was going on here in Arkansas uh, for the status on women. And that interim study that came out in late 2012 indicated that Arkansas ranks seventh highest rate of poverty for women uh, in the nation. Our state ranks number seven for the highest level of poverty, whether it's minority or non-minority women Women in Arkansas rank number seven overall, overall in, in the nation for poverty. Then there was a 2009 report from the Institute for Women's Policy Research uh, out of D.C. that found that Arkansas ranked between 47th and 50th on the most measures examined for, um, from women's median annual earnings. Uh, our earnings are one of the lowest in the nation's here in Arkansas for women. 
uh, the percent of women living above poverty, one of the lowest rates here in our state. For educational level of women, we are one of the lowest ranked states in the nation. And so when we talk about health, you have to talk about all of those other social determinants of health, because it's not just the fact that I don't want to go to the doctor today. It may be the fact that I don't have transportation even to go to the doctor. It may be that I don't even have a $25 copay to afford. And I'm going to tell you that I may now be able to afford a copay, but about five years ago, I was unable to afford $25 for each one of my children's physicals per year. And I know that there's many of you who are poor out here. I, when, I, when I was a student, I was very poor. Um, and there's people all throughout our state who, if, even if you say, well, why don't they go and come on now, you're, you're choosing not to purchase insurance. And the reality is that they can't afford it, that they are working poor, that they are not poverty, uh, excuse me, that they are not lazy that they are not individuals who are just simply trying to live off the dole, but they are literally working, some people working two and three jobs, but yet and still do not have enough money to meet all of their basic needs and then purchase health insurance. Their health gets on the back burner. So as a part of the work that we do at the Minority Health Commission, we are very involved with legislation. Uh, matter of fact, we are probably catalysts in the state to building uh, coalitions and making sure that the issues related to not only minority citizens, but uh, poor and underserved citizens across the state are, are, are looked at and, and that we're there every day at the legislature talking to your legislatures here from Jonesboro, legislators from Springdale, legislators from El Dorado and Texarkana and Eudora and all over this state about the Affordable Care Act. Um, how many of you know the ins and outs of the Affordable Care Act? And do you, do you feel that you have a good niche for how that's going to help us in this state? Well, there's a lot of folks who deal with it every day that don't understand it completely either. But those of us who are there working through the process, connecting those dots for you, uh, we're making sure that the voices of women, the voices of the underserved are, are being heard there at the state legislature. For that reason, the Arkansas Minority Health Commission and the consortium have supported the expansion of Medicaid. We've supported uh, the Affordable Care Act being implemented fully here in the state of Arkansas. And one of the reasons we do that is because it has the ability to provide insurance to those people that I was telling you about. Matter of fact, maybe some of you sitting here in the audience who but for the fact that you really don't have the full ability to afford it, but yet you're working, or maybe you have a cousin or an uncle or a mother or a brother who they work two jobs, but yet you know they don't have insurance. Um, those are the kind of people that this Affordable Care Act will cover. About 250,000 people will be eligible for Medicaid here in the state that currently do, do not have it. Arkansas has one of the most restrictive Medicaid uh, for poverty level um, uh, levels uh, in the nation. You have to have, uh, they only go up to 17%. When the Affordable Care Act kicks in fully, it will hopefully take it all the way up to 138% of poverty. So therefore, that's where those 250,000 people are. From 17% of poverty, if you're at 18% of poverty, you don't qualify for any additional assistance in this state. It's one of the lowest in the nation. Matter of fact, number two in the nation. So there's many people who really need it. There are people in this state who have <laughs> HIV and literally cannot work, but they can't qualify for disability. So they're out there, still have the disease. Some don't know it, so they're still spreading it because they don't qualify for basic services. Many of them are working even, but they don't qualify to take care of themselves, to get access to services because we have one of the most restrictive uh, 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 levels of poverty here in this state. Um, in addition, the uh, Affordable Care Act will, for you guys, this is a provision that's already in effect. Uh, it will allow young adults up to the age of 26 to be, stay on their parents' insurance. So it used to be when you turned 18, you were kicked off and then you'd have to get insurance through your college, pay, you know, get separate insurance plans as an adult now at 18, 19. Now through the Affordable Care Act, your parents can keep you on their insurance until you're age 26. And it's benefiting parents all over this state right now. And I'm telling you, we see people every day who thank us for the work that's being done at the legislature. For women, 
those children in our state who are, how many of you are familiar with the Our Kids First program? Our Kids First is one of the most wonderfulest programs uh, that, that we have, and not every state have an Our Kids program where children under the age of 18, uh, predominantly the, most of our children in the state, about 82% of the children of Arkansas are covered um, on Our Kids First. Again, that goes back to what Dr. Solinger said. You know, that's Medicaid coverage. That, that deals with poverty. That deals with the living wages that we're dealing with here uh, that are so low in Arkansas that so many have to be there. But as soon as the, the Affordable Care Act kicks in, uh, those uh, parents, the mothers of those children on Our Kids First will automatically be eligible. And how many of you know that when you have a healthy mother and you have he a healthy workforce, then that benefits the whole of the state. So we're proud of the work that's happening. When I have an opportunity or a question comes up because I'm getting the cut it off sign, um, we can talk about the abortion bills that are right now before the legislature um, that are restrictive of 20 weeks. We even have one that is probably uh, was vetoed by the governor yesterday and probably has been signed into law already still or voted back in by the, uh, the legislature that's 12 weeks. There's even one there that's six weeks. And they have huge implications for women, huge implications for underserved communities. And we can talk about that later if you'd like. Thank you. Arkansas, but also it came through the Susan G. Coleman uh, program. 
Now, for some of the some, some of the concerns, I think um, one of the studies that are, are or one of the reports that I just read is that women's health across the board, we have decreased mortality rates since the 1980s and consistently have gone down. They are not, the experts are really not sure why that's occurring. They're looking at poverty. They're looking at the decrease in like your pap smears every year, your mamm mammographies every year, to every three to every five years, but that's not proven because there's no research on that yet. If you just looked at whether smoking was impacting women's mortality to lower the, her, uh, lower our life expectancy, then we would look at men because men are exposed to smoke too. And we find that men's life expectancy is maintained or even increased. So that men who were born in 1980 are actually uh, uh, expecting to live longer lives where women who were born in 1980 are expecting to see decrease in their mortality rate. I mean, an increase in mortality rate. Uh, the other thing is one of the problems, and I'm not sure you addressed it, but we have one of the highest teenage pregnancy rates in the country, which is concern, of great concern. Um, we also have a, a huge rate of, which she'll talk about this, but I did sexual abuse exams in children for, for 17 years. And we know that when you have issues of poverty or uh, stress or problems, it's not caused for that because we see sexual abuse across all economic levels. But we know that when people are stressed, then child abuse does increase. So with the poverty levels in Arkansas, we do know that that can be, is, maybe, will be an issue. Uh, and the other uh, issue is the Fed, federal government has just announced a release for all state governments saying that they do not have to pay the level of uh, Medicaid visits that they're paying now. They can actually reduce the rate that they pay to healthcare providers. Um, that's up to the states and the choice, but uh, for, for instance, I work in a clinic, we see Medicaid patients, and if I see a Medicaid patient from Missouri in the clinic where I work, I do, I will get paid $8.67 to see a Missouri Medicaid patient. And because my clinic is very close to the state line, I have a large number of Missouri patients that come. If the state of Missouri decides that they're going to lower that level. If they lower that to say seven dollars and fifty cents, and that's just supposition. I truly don't know what they would even consider. That's not enough to pay for the chart. It's not enough to pay for the nurse. It's definitely not enough to pay my salary, the rent, the supplies that are needed to take care of our uh, patients. So we have some critical issues that are coming up including that we're going to have a huge influx of patients who need care. And that's a challenge, and I really am excited about that. Because if I take care of someone and they, I look at the tab and it says self-pay, I have to talk to them. I prescribe off the Walmart $4 list, but I also have to make sure that they have enough for that $4 um, uh, prescription that they need. Uh, so my practice is um, dictated by cost and what I can prescribe for someone. I also have to ask questions before I uh, ask for labs because we know a lab is going to be an additional charge. If they come to my clinic and they want gonorrhea and syphilis, it's going to be over $100 additional charge. The office visit is like $100. So for someone that uh, is struggling just to put food on their table for their children or pay their bills, that $200 is an incredible amount. So I do use the local health department. I do encourage them to go there because of the $5 visit. But again, then you come up to the point where they may can walk to my clinic. They may not have transportation to a health department. The immunizations, there's, like I said, there's lots of good things in Arkansas. Your immunizations are covered. We do a really, I think, really good job of that. But I think we're going to face lots and lots of challenges. And although I think the, uh, the healthcare reforms are great, 
I think there's still some, the jury's out on some of it. I think it's kind of scary for us. I'll try to behave and not get cut off. Um, <laughs> I to talk a lot, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, our organization, uh, the Women's Crisis Center of Northeast Arkansas, um, we've been around for 25 plus years, um, providing services to women and their children and, and others. Our services are also expanded to the gay and lesbian community. Um, it's not just a women's issue strictly anymore to be a victim of domestic violence. We don't talk about that much, but um, for the women and children that we serve, which is what we see most often, um, providing services in Arkansas is quite challenging um, due to the fact that they're coming to us with poverty issues and then on top of that dealing with an organization like ours that also has poverty issues. <laughs> uh, we struggle. Um, I'm also involved with the Arkansas Coalition Against Domestic Violence which is a state organization that provides technical assistance and education and other support to all of the shelter programs in the state of Arkansas. Um, what I know about services like ours that we provide here in Jonesboro and all across the state of Arkansas, the problems are similar, is that um, there are very little resources for us to provide services. Um, I, I know personally here in Jonesboro, I rely a lot on our community to help with fundraising and to um, help sustain our program through our own efforts other than federal and state funding because there is such a small amount um, of federal and state funding in Arkansas for domestic violence and sexual assault services. Um, it's very challenging for us when we have um, women and children come to our shelter, which by the way, we, we operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we ensure that someone is available to, to assist someone in an emergency at all hours. Um, so it, it becomes very challenging for us when we when they come to us with sick children um, I, I, and, and illnesses and, and other issues um, surrounding the fact that they can't get adequate health care. Um, and then we are placed in a position at that point of an urgent need to find a way to provide that health care for, um, for them and their children, and it's, and it's hard because we are limited as an agency as to what we can do. Um, so, you know, for example, um, I, I dread every year flu season <laughs> because we have a house full of people um, that get ill and we have very limited resources to, to provide medication. And for those of our clients who, who do work, two and three jobs um, to try and support their children and for whatever reason may not qualify for some type of social service or public assistance, um, it's impossible for them to be able to afford medication and to afford those office visits. Um, so we see many, many, many clients who fall between the cracks and um, then as agencies like mine who desperately, desperately want to help them uh, we find ourselves in a position that is similar to their own, <laughs> where we, we do the best we can to provide what services we can with very, very limited money. So um, legislatively, uh, we have a lot of work to do here in Arkansas because I think part of the problem is that domestic violence and sexual assault are still not very uh, taken very seriously um, in our state. Um, certainly in comparison to some of the other state coalitions that I've had contact with and who are much more proactive in their, their states to address um, issues surrounding abuse. And I'll stop and I, I'm curious to know what you want to know about rather than what we want to tell you. So um, I'm anxious to get to your questions. Thank you. you all today, a, a variety of experts uh, put all together. I think it's a, a tremendous uh, example, really, of, of the kind of need, quite frankly. Uh, and when there is a need, sometimes, if we're lucky, people do step forward to fill it. Uh, but what struck me in particular uh, was, for one, Kathy, 
Am I hearing this correctly? On one hand, um, we will have millions more who will be getting health insurance. But because there are not enough physicians, it's going to fall to the nurse practitioners to, to provide a lot of that care. But at the same time, in terms of your compensation for that care, I'm thinking of the Missouri case, is there a connection there? Could Missouri then say, okay, we want the nurse practitioner to now assist these people who are coming into the system, but yes, and also we want to pay you $8. To, is that pretty much where we are with that? Did I do the math right there? That's, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, we really don't know how it's going to be impacted. We do know that if you're a nurse practitioner in a clinic of your own, we're only reimbursed at 85% of what a physician is reimbursed. That's acceptable, but when you look at the Medicaid reimbursement, you're looking at actually pennies on the dollar. Now, we still want to see them because that's part of our practice, but again, if they lower it lower than it is, it makes it very difficult for you to pay the, again, the rent, your supplies, and staff. And to get to the gender issue, about what percentage of the nurse practitioners are female? Uh, probably about 85 to 90 percent are female. Yes, so, so the, the math here is rather interesting when it comes to, yes, care will be made as long as we have a large group of getting back to Dr. Solinger's point about rather underpaid workforce, and it will be a largely female workforce that then will be filling in that, that breach, and that breach no less does need to be filled in, no question, uh, but I think it's interesting how the burden will fall to a, a a particular sector of the economy that is, what's the percentage again that are female, right? Yeah. Uh, so the burden will fall primarily to female professionals in many ways who will be undercompensated. Uh, so that's an important issue. And Dr. Trotter? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just interject with that, with the Affordable Care Act, one of the provisions that is in the Affordable Care Act that will take effect in 2014, I believe it is, is making the Medicaid reimbursement the same as Medicare. It was a provision, yay for all the nurse practitioners out there. You know, it was a provision that was thought of beforehand. Um, in addition, the Affordable Care Act has a lot of things going on in the state. Our state, Arkansas, has been the, f the leader. Other states are looking at us as, at, as to what we're doing and the things that we're putting in place. And one of the other provisions in the Affordable Care Act is to look at the shortage. You know that when you put $250,000, dump those folks on the first day in January, um, and we already have a shortage right now. So for the last two years, our Surgeon General, Dr. Joe Thompson, has actually been working with a broad group of individuals to look at all of the different multi-factors that will need to take place. And one of those issues is raising the reimbursement rates for nurse practitioners. It's a battle because the doctors don't want that to happen, to be honest with you. So our medical board has some issues with it. But they are issues that are in the Affordable Care Act that's meant to leverage the playing field across the board and at the end of the day provide great service for those individuals out there in the public who needs that service. This deficit of physicians, uh, Columbia University in New York had X number of physicians available for primary care, interns, uh, residencies, and they only had um, applications for like 10%. So all of those residency positions were left open. Um, it's a huge issue. It is a, it is a huge issue. And it won't, it won't get solved overnight, but and, and the, the whole issue of the Affordable Care Act is that it definitely has some holes that need to be filled, but it's better than, it will be better than what's happening right now. Right now, we're paying for it anyway because the uninsured costs of emergency room visits, guess who pays for that? Your mom, your dad, me, all of you who work in our, in our taxes. Right now, we know that the Affordable Care Act, the study that's been done uh, that the Surgeon General's Office of Arkansas just put out about three weeks ago, will save 2,300 lives every single year just simply by implementing the Affordable Care Act in Arkansas. So it's, it has some provisions. We've got to do better with, we've got to work um, across multi-organizations to fill those positions to have people there available 
to help those folks that are coming on, but I promise you there's a wonderful working group of individuals that are, that's been doing, working on this for the past two years and hopefully we'll get there. Does this mean that um, training to be a nurse practitioner is a really good job opportunity in Arkansas? If anybody out there who would like to join the medical is, is profession, true? because there's clearly, clearly a need. And I thought for a while that we should have a medical school in this end of Arkansas. Is there a reason why we should? And is there, what? Cost. Yes. Oh, it costs money yes. to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And make, well, what about, again, you know, well, I, I guess if one cares about life, then that's an issue, right? Well, uh, also I was wondering about the comment of, about um, uh, premarital, not premarital sex, Teen that pregnancy. Really happens in Arkansas. Oh, no. <laughs> but that thing that, that meant that the immaculate uh, conception that happens with our unwed mothers in Arkansas, I want them to hear um, the, the rates of this, and also Vicki, if you could then speak to possibly, so this is sort of a combination of these two here, uh, about uh, if there is a relationship to uh, the age of motherhood, getting back to that, not just legitimate, but safe mother, um, I would presume perhaps that our, our interestingly low or high rates, I should say, of, of unwed teen, motherhood. Teen motherhood. Teen motherhood. Unwed teen motherhood, because you can wed at an yeah, age but, here. But unwed teen Marriage is over. Is there a relationship <laughs> that you're seeing between that and domestic violence? Oh, absolutely. And, and, it, and the reasons are simple. Is um, it, it simply limits their options. Um, I, I don't like, I do not like to hear that we've got such a huge number of um, teen pregnancies in the state. Um, we definitely need to um, address this issue um, because sadly it's, it, it, well, I come back to the simple point is that teen mothers have very limited options, particularly if they come from families where um, they were already impoverished to begin with there's already a history of domestic violence um, or dating violence or um, sexual abuse. Um, it puts them at greater risk 300%. And this is not to say that if someone comes from uh, circumstances where they've experienced domestic or sexual violence that they are definitely doomed to uh, repeat this and live this way. However, um, 300 percent it, it, it definitely increases your risk so um, when I when I see this and, and we see it a lot um, I've had mothers in the shelter uh, in the domestic violence shelter who have teenage daughters with them and they're both pregnant at the same time you know we've, we've had circumstances like this um, as well and, and it's just um, a cycle that's that's hard to break, particularly um, under circumstances where the resources are not sufficient. I, I, I'd just like to make a comment about what some studies of teen pregnancy have shown is, thank you, um, is that teen pregnancy doesn't cause poverty and teen pregnancy doesn't cause domestic violence that went uh, as everything that everybody's talking about today has to do really with the lack of resources to provide decent services simultaneous with the growing income disparity in the United States. So more people are poor and more people are poorer than this growing stable group of rich people and the middle class is fraying. Um, but when young women have very few options for becoming mature adults. There aren't living wage jobs. They can't move out of their parents' house because they can't afford apartments. There are so many ways in which you guys, because you are college students, are marking your passage toward adulthood, but young women who are living in extreme poverty don't have those options but one way that you can mark yourself as not a child anymore is to become a mother and one of the things we know is that young women who have options in life including the option to go to college are less likely to have children 
before they re have enough resources to manage it. And you know, much, much of it too um, is and always has been, especially in our state, um, a really um, a lack of education. Education is still a big issue surrounding all of these subjects that we're talking about here this evening. Um, it, it has been an issue for a long time. And I think that until we address that, um, I know that in, you know, I've been doing public education, et cetera, um, for, for many years now in, in Northeast Arkansas. And I can tell you that in some of, some of the more rural areas, um, that I, I have experienced a real lack of um, people wanting to discuss this at all. Um, I know that I've, I, in the past I've approached schools um, in, in very rural areas here in Northeast Arkansas where um, we weren't allowed to come in and do um, education um, in, in terms of uh, date rape was a, was a big issue, um, stalking and date rape for teens. We had programs that, that we could possibly implement in some of the schools and we were met with some resistance um, due to the fact that it, it's just not something that, that they wanted to talk about. I was told at one point um, that, that that within in the certain school system they were taught abstinence. And I had to explain to the administrator that we were not there to talk about um, abstinence versus not abstinence, but rather the crime of date rape and sexual assault and the things that can happen after that, such as pregnancy and STDs and, and things of that nature. So we still have a lot to do in terms of education as well.